Hi, I'm Matthew Serm, um, and I'm standing um, in Pukiavik, formerly known as Barrow, Alaska. I'm actually a little bit out of town at a research site that has a ton of instruments. And I wanted to talk to people today a little bit about why we're up here in the Arctic, what we're doing, and why it might be important to them even if they don't live in the Arctic. So uh, the first thing is we're about 72 degrees north latitude, and it's June 3rd. And if you look around and we'll pan in a minute, it looks like the dead of winter because, in fact, it snowed this morning. And in places we have 10 feet of snow. Also, the tundra here, which is green, is still covered by somewhere on the order of a foot of snow. It's summer for a lot of people, but why are we here? And the reason we're here is that what happens up in the Arctic actually doesn't stay in the Arctic. We're in a world where the snow covers everything, not just here on the land, but at the sea, which is still frozen. That snow is very bright. It's like a great big mirror. The sunlight coming in hits the snow, goes right back to space. Somewhere between 80% and 60% of solar energy that hits snow just goes back to space. So that's good for the planet when it's warming, because that's energy we don't absorb on Earth and it doesn't help warm us. The thing that determines whether it's going to go back to space is when the snow melts. And snow melt sounds like it's a boring process, but it's not. A lot of things happen, and when it happens matters. I'm going to go back to the date. It's June 3rd. Most people know that June 21st, that's the solstice. That's the day the sun hits its maximum up here, and that's only a couple weeks off. So we still have a reflector that's reflecting 80% of the sunlight just as we're getting in close to when the most sunlight is. We melt that snow a lot earlier, and then we would absorb it. If we melt it later, we won't. It's a big difference in how much we cool the planet. It sounds a little strange, like, well, what do I care if I live in Iowa? But there are 30 million square kilometers, exactly what's behind me, 30 million square kilometers. So it's, it's an area, it's a vast area the size of large countries covered with snow right now that's going to melt. So when it melts, it makes a big difference to whether your climate's going to warm in Iowa, Ohio, Florida, Arizona, and up in the Arctic as well. This experiment called SALVO, fancy name for snow albedo evolution, which really just means how fast is the reflection of snow going to change in the spring. We've been doing it about three years on this particular experiment. And meanwhile, we've got a ton of other instruments that are measuring the important things. For and if you look in the background of me, it probably looks very white because it is. And that's because the snow hasn't melted up here in the Arctic. Um, the white world, the world covered in snow, lasts from about October well into June. Nine, ten months of the year, we're snow covered here, and that snow reflects light. So you'd think snow melt was a simple process. We just warm it up and the snow melts. But a lot of things go into how we melt snow. First, how much solar energy we get. In other words, how much sun, and how warm it is. All of those combine to decide when the snow will melt. And while it wouldn't seem to matter much, if we melt the snow two weeks early or two weeks late, we get a huge difference in the amount of solar energy we absorb. So what are the processes that take place during snowmelt? Well, solar energy comes down, and first we have to ask whether it's absorbed by the snow or reflected. If it's absorbed, then a couple other things happen. It goes into snow that's very cold, and it'll freeze. The energy will liberate a little bit of water, and that'll freeze and start making ice lenses of the snow. Those ice lenses will block subsequent water, and the amount of water down in the snow will also control how fast If we're on the sea ice, as we make more and more melt, water will flood the sea ice. Now that'll help take the snow. So there's just a whole myriad of processes that go into the speed of which we melt the snow. And if we go back to what my first statement was, melting two weeks earlier, two weeks later, that month period, has an enormous impact on the climate. I'm standing in front of the Chukchi Sea. It's frozen right now for about a mile out and then there's a lead out there. A lead is an open, it's like an open river in the ocean there. But this is frozen sea ice behind me. And it's a little hard to tell the difference um, between it and the land, but it functions a little differently. There's 14 million square kilometers of what you can see behind me, also reflecting sunlight. So, a lot of our work up here, we're working not only on the tundra, 
but on the sea ice as well. They measure about the same things, but a little bit later as the snow melts, they're going to diverge in what happens and that sea ice will flood. And that's going to be pretty interesting. So little processes, the melting of one little grain of snow, um, basically can affect how much energy overall the Earth is because we're multiplying by a vast area. So it's like a, a saying we came up with in a different project, tiny crystals, low water.